Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Stephanie Valdez. I'm the co-owner of Community Bookstore, and welcome. Um, I see a lot of regulars and friendly faces here. And um, today we're thrilled to have Howard Bloom presenting his new book. Um, Howard will be in conversation with uh, Steve Macknick, who is a neuroscientist and columnist for the Scientific American. Please welcome Howard and Steve. Thank you, Stephanie. So, so let me start with a Timothy Leary quote about Howard's book. This is a monumental, epic, glorious literary achievement. Every page, every paragraph, every sentence sparkles with captivating metaphors, delightful verbal concoctions, alchemical insights, philosophic whimsy, absurd illogicals, scientific comedy routines, relentless, non-stopping waves of hilarity. The comparisons to James Joyce are inevitable and undeniable. Finnegan's Wake wanders through the rock and roll 60s. Wow, whew, wild, wonderful, Timothy Leary. <laughs> Howard, right? as you know. So, so I've, I've read the book, and um, I agree with Timothy. It's, it's, <laughs> it's wonderful. I don't have his his uh, wonderful hyperbolic sense, <laughs> but I do have a few questions about, uh, for you about this. And, and one of the ones that, that, that I felt I was so excited about in reading your book was to learn more about the 60s, because I, I kind of missed the 60s. I was born in 1968. Wow. And so, uh, but in a way, I feel like I was there for it because I was raised on the island of Maui in Hawaii, which was one of the... Uh, the hippie enclaves uh, in in the 70s and, and 80s especially, and uh, its biggest cash crop was marijuana. Amazing. And, uh, and so, I I grew up around people who who were from what they claimed to be the hippie culture, and one of the things that I found to be surprising in reading your book is that science is pervasive through this book. It starts with science. Your childhood is um, perfused with science. Your love of, of Einstein and everything that came beyond that and ever since and your, and your role now um, in, as, a, as a science facilitator uh, for big science projects it shows your central role in many aspects of science but that's a disconnect from the people I knew that called themselves hippies. And it's a disconnect with my perhaps um, inappropriate uh, understanding of the 60s. And I was hoping maybe you could, could help me understand how, why is it that, that, I, that I equate new agey kind of um, age of Aquarius thinking with, with the hippie movement when you as one of its founders is, is so ingrained with science? How does that, how, how do you reconcile this? Well, what I, I'll give you a little bit of background first. So I got into science at the age of 10 in theoretical physics and microbiology. When I was 12 years old and realized I was an atheist, my parents tried to drag me off to temple for the high holiday services. And as I was clinging to the car door with both hands and they were pulling at my ankles, I realized something. You're an atheist, Bloom. There are no gods in the heavens above you. There are no gods beneath your feet. And yet there are gods in this scene. They're inside your parents. I mean, this was, they were threatening to shred my socks, for God's sakes, their only son. They were threatening to tear in half. What could produce such passion? So I took my interest in all of the real hard sciences and tried to use it as a lens to see the forces of history, to see these deep passions that make gods in the world, that make things like Nazism and Trumpism and a variety of other um, often horrible um, movements and sometimes wonderful movements. So, and the thing that got me into science at the age of 10 was a book that appeared on my lap one day in my great big living room in Buffalo, New York. And it said the first two rules of science are these, the truth at any price including the price of your life. And it gave the example of Galileo and it told the story all wrong. Um, as if Galileo had been, had stuck with his truth to the bitter end, now he made a deal with the Pope, abjured everything he'd ever written. Uh, and lived under house arrest instead of being burned at the stake. But it didn't tell me that. Um, thank God. 
It, it portrayed him as a man of courage. And the second rule was look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before and then proceed from there. Look for the things that are invisible to you because you and everybody around you take them for granted. I mean, this, you were doing this last night in the presentation of your book. Um, and then proceed from there. And, and it gave the example of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who looked at fresh human sperm under a microscope and um, sent a letter to the Royal Society saying he had just discovered microscopic animalcules. He had just discovered a whole new world, a microscopic world. So those two guys were my example. And when I went off on my quest in the 60s, I told people that I was looking for Zen Buddhist Satori. And that, in fact, is what I believed that I was doing. I was looking for enlightenment. I mean, it, when you're 19 years old, you're very depressed. You're in between things. You're in something this book calls the villager stage of life. You've thrown yourself out of your family at the age of 12 or 13 or 14. And you've tried to find a new family of peers. And it has never quite worked. You've always felt out of place in society. And you're trying to find your place in society. So there is a great deal of pain, especially if you're me when you're 19 years old. And I was looking for enlightenment to accomplish two things. Um, I wanted it to stop my pain, but I also wanted it to give me a lens through which I could see the infinite and the tiniest of things. Because two other, three other influences on my life were poets. And those poets were William Blake, who talked about seeing the infinite and the tiniest of things. Um, T.S. Eliot, who said in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, if you have something heroic in life to do and you think it will define you, don't put it off. If you put it off, you'll find yourself at 50 years old with no life energy to do it anymore. And uh, it'll be too late. Start it. If you have something you deeply believe in that you think is important, start it now. Start it today. And the third poem was by Edna St. Vincent Lay. And it was called Renaissance. And she, in essence, said, if you come to understand every extreme of the human emotional possibilities, it will expand you. And you will be able to see the infinite in the tiniest of things. So I was on a quest based on scientific, scientific goals. But it was a quest for knowledge. It was a quest for understanding. It was a quest for really big picture insights into things. And science was essential to that. But so was Zen Buddhist Satori, which looked at enlightenment, which is seeing everything um, in a mystic way. Well, a lot of the people in the 60s picked up on the mystic aspect of this. And they didn't pick up on the science aspect of this. So you, you ask a very good question. Why is the hippie movement not known for what it did in science, but actually things were going on in science. Because once LSD hit the world of science thinkers, it made a big difference. Solomon, whatever his name is, who discovered the neuroreceptor, which you work with all the time, he discovered this on LSD. I mean, he, because of the kinds of insights that LSD gave him, he was able to come up with this idea. Um, Christopher Bohm who writes about, he's an anthropologist. He's the head of the Jane Goodall Research Center at, at the University of South California. Um, he was with Leary uh, at Harvard. And, um, and it, LSD was essential to his insights. So we talked about mind expansion in those days. I mean, late in the 60s. My period in the 60s is in this book is 1961 and 1962 before the 60s realized it had an identity, that it was a distinct um, entity of its own. So a lot of people pick up on the mystic aspects, and they don't pick up on the hard aspect. And when I first got to read, there was an extremely popular teacher. He was the most popular teacher on campus. He was an art history teacher. And why was he the most popular teacher? Because he was actually teaching mysticism and enlightenment in his class. But one of the things that he, I never took his class, but he was so famous on campus, you got to know his ideas. And one of his insights was, you cannot achieve enlightenment until you're 40 years old, and you have a wife and kids, a car, and a mortgage. In other words, he was saying these nitty gritty things, like the truth at any price, including the price of your life, and look at things that are under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and look for the scientific roots of things, that's essential to the process of enlightenment. So all I can say is I regret the fact that I wasn't able to get the scientific aspect across to those people who decided to become my followers. 
So, as a as a fellow author, I have to ask, how did you score a Timothy Leary quote for your yeah. book? <laughs> well, okay, the story of how the book came to be is that um, because I was interested in finding the gods inside of us, I turned down four graduate school fellowships in what is now neuroscience, your field, and got into something I knew absolutely nothing about, popular culture, and founded the biggest PR firm in the music industry. And that's when I worked with all of the acts that Stephanie just told us about. And then in 1988, I got really horribly sick. And I was trapped in a bed for 15 years. And for five years, I was too weak to speak and too weak to have another person in the room with me. And it was nightmarish because when you are trapped in utter solitary confinement, your mind produces pains for which there are no words in the English language. It produces a plethora of them. So I was in a state of serious pain, mental pain. And I knew from the research, you know, I kept up on my scientific research and was already in the process of writing my first book, The Lucifer Principle. And I knew from the research that if you don't have any social ties, you die. Your immune system goes into underdive, your cognitive system goes into underdive, you go into incredible self-destructive pain. And I had to somehow have a social system, even though I couldn't talk, and even though I couldn't have another person in the room with me. So I had had all of these wild adventures in the 1960s, and I used to tell people about them. They were an oral tradition, and their jaws would drop, and they would sit there, and they would want to hear more stories for hours. It was amazing. And so I figured, OK, I'm sick. When you are sick, you, my friend Valerius Geist, who is one of the really dominant experts in large mammal behavior and is an evolutionary biologist, he says all forms of communication come down to two things, attraction cues and repulsion cues. And as a sick person, I was giving off repulsion cues. People run from people who are so sick. I had to give off attraction cues. Well, one of the things that saved me, laying there in that bed all by myself, were P.G. Wodehouse and Dave Barry. Their humor was so incredibly exultant that it took me into a virtual reality for three or four hours at a time. And it's a virtual reality in which you forget everything, all of your pains. They all go away. These guys were transcendent as humorists. So I figured, OK, I will write my stories from the 1960s in the style, to the best of my ability, inspired by Dave Barry and P.G. Wodehouse. Because humor is an attraction cue. And right now, I need attraction cues. So I wrote this book as a series of letters to friends. And in those days, we had snail mail. Very few people had email. So they went out by snail mail to my friends. And yes, indeed, I did find two people who were willing to stick with me through this horrible, horrible crisis. Only two out of all the people that I tried. But they were a lifesaver. They were an absolute lifesaver. OK, I finished. It took me five years of writing these letters to finish the book and then put it together in book form. Well, I'm a publicist, for God's sakes. I'm not just a scientist. I've been a publicist for 17 years of my life. And I know that I need to get endorsements for my book in order to validate it. And I wanted to find 1960s people who would endorse this. So I have a friend, Eric Gardner, who started his show business career as a tour road manager for the Jefferson Airplane. I figured, OK, I'll try to get the book to the Jefferson Airplane and see if I can get an opinion from them. So I wrote to Eric. Again, it was snail mail days. And Eric wrote back and said, I have somebody much better for you than the Jefferson Airplane. I have this client named Timothy Leary. So we printed out the whole book, and we sent it out to LA. And Timothy, or uh, Eric said he had gotten the quote to Timothy, or he'd gotten the book to Timothy Leary. And six weeks later, this astonishing quote just stunning quote showed up. Well, I knew what was happening. I'm not naive. I knew that Eric had written this quote and gotten Timothy's, uh, he'd gotten Timothy to say yes to sending it out under Timothy's name. There was no way Timothy Leary had written something so positive about something I, a mere pile of crap on the face of planet Earth, had written. Ten years later, when I was still stuck in bed and now could talk to people and have other people in the room with me, my friend Douglas Rushkoff, the author, came over to the bedroom to see me. And he brought with him an artist from San Francisco. And the two of them said, 
explained to me that they had spent Timothy Leary's last six months at Timothy Leary's bedside with Timothy Leary. Okay, I knew this quote hadn't come from Timothy Leary. And because I was stuck in a bed, I had a printer set up immediately next to the bed and a keyboard on my lap. So I printed out two copies of this quote and handed it to them. You can do that without having to reach very far. They were at the foot of the bed. And they read the quote, and this horrid silence descended on the room. Well, I knew exactly why that silence had descended, because these two guys didn't want to hurt me. They didn't want to hurt my feelings, but it was quite obvious that the quote hadn't come from Timothy Leary. And when they opened their mouths, they said, this is Tim. And in the it's a making me cry, I'm sorry. But in the way that they said it, you could feel that entire six months of sitting with a friend who was dying and losing that friend in the end. You could feel the whole thing in just those words. And Timothy Leary was present in the room for them. And it took me another three years to process that. And then I realized I wrote this book trying to achieve the kind of transcendent humor that had saved me and the worst of my illness. Timothy Leary was dying of prostate cancer when he got the book. He was in the same condition I had been in when I had written this. And the book had done what I hoped it would do. It had lifted him to the kind of transcendent plane that Dave Barry and P.G. Wodehouse gifted to me. And I just found that astonishingly moving. So it was a Timothy Leary quote, after all. That's wonderful. So um, the, the, what do you think uh, is, the, is the real spirit of the 60s? Well, you perceived it, and nobody else quite has. It is to use all of your senses and all of your tools, which means science, art, history, everything to try to come up with huge, comprehensive insights into the cosmos, a secular equivalent of enlightenment. Um, it is to adventure. Why adventure? What is an adventure? An adventure is something that takes you to the brink and a little bit beyond. It's something that you could die from. You're risking everything on some of the adventures that you have. I certainly was risking everything with many of the adventures in, in this book. But when you go beyond the bounds of, the sa of safety and you go into the extremes of human life and you spend time getting to know people that you ordinarily would never know and you come to comprehend them in your heart or in your empathic centers or in your mirror neurons or whatever it is, it expands you. And you and I are feelers in a larger entity. We're, culture is a mass perceptual entity. And the bounds of culture are constantly growing. And they are grown, that is, more and more things are perceivable by culture with each generation. And the ones who make those new perceptions possible and bring them into the realm of the normal are the adventurers. So it is your obligation not only to follow T.S. Eliot's advice, and if you have something important to do in life, if you have an adventure, start it now. Do not leave it for tomorrow. It is also crucial to do what Edna St. Vincent Millay was talking about, which is go out and experience the extremes, that you, the most extremes that you can find. So you can expand you, and in the process of expanding you, can bring new knowledge back to the rest of humanity. That, to me, is the real spirit of the 60s. And we are living in a time, we're living in the Trump era. Truth is being trashed. It's being trashed horribly, and only two men so far have been willing to speak up about it, Bob Corker and Jeff Flake. And their speeches were very moving, especially Jeff Flake yesterday, because they said it's time to get back to truth. We have a lying president. This is all about truth. It's the truth at any price, including the price of your life. That, too, is the spirit of the 60s. So... Why do you say in your book that there are two branches to the hippie movement? Well, because when I was hitchhiking out on the West Coast, I hitchhiked all the way from, first I hitchhiked from 
um, Portland to Seattle. I was going to school in Portland, Oregon. I dropped out of Reed College, the college that Steve Jobs dropped out of. Um, and um, when I was hitchhiking up and down the West Coast, I was picked up one day by this big guy with a beard, and it was a pickup truck that was falling apart, and he had a beautiful girlfriend in the cab, and God knows how they fit me in with the two of them, because it was only one seat. And he was a Marxist, and he was uh, into communes, and he ran a commune. And I ran into various other people who ran communes. These people were a different kind of person than me. I was on a spiritual quest with science underpinnings. And these guys, instead of being open to new experience, they were closed. They were pinched-lipped. They were people who wanted to deny other people the right to all kinds of things. They ran these totalitarian little communes in which whoever had founded it got to sleep with everybody's wife, everybody's girlfriend, everybody's daughter. Um, and they were dogmatists. They were the very opposite of what the spirit of the 60s was to me. They were closed people. And I hated those people. I mean, you know, I didn't hate them in the sense that I would do them any harm. I never would. But I hated them in the sense of what they were, they were putting a blot on humanity. So I came back in 1962 after a year of absence, hitchhiking, riding the rails, and all of that kind of stuff. I came back to my hometown of Buffalo, New York. And I had very few friends there. Most people didn't like me. But I did have a friend who had brought me into the Unitarian Youth Group. He was a Catholic, and the two of us found a commonality in the Unitarian Youth Group. He was a very charismatic person. And standing there on the University of Buffalo campus in my hometown, I said, there are two branches to this movement that I've just come from. And one is the spiritual branch, and the other is the political branch. And the political branch would go on to protest against the war in Vietnam and all kinds of things like that that would make them famous. But if you, if you look at how they treated their women, they were totalitarians. And they didn't want any of us to have any fun. They wanted New York. I mean, there was a famous conference. Danny Goldberg has covered this in his book on 1967. There was a conference where all the major intellectuals of the political left in the hippie movement got together. And they said, in 10 years, there will be no more New York City. There will be deer wandering in forests where New York City was. Well, has anybody seen a deer on the way over here today? I mean, did you see? You did? Only on acid. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so New York is still here, and it's more vibrant than ever before. They wanted to deny us the very city experience that makes life rich for all of us, every single person in this room. They are den they're, they're deniers. They're people who push away the good things of life. And look at, the, look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before. In other words, find the joy and the infinity in the things that are good and stop the things that are bad. That was not their spirit. No. So as a scientist, I would like to know what is, do you think, the, the main message for science in your book? Oh, God. Um, that's definitely not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so no, that's definitely not one of them. So, um, the, the message for science is that science lives in a limited world, too. You know, my one only experience is it's in this book. When I was 12, I co designed a computer that won Science Fair Awards, and I built my first Boolean algebra machine. And I was being tutored uh, in engineering principles by the head of research and development for the Moog Valve Corporation, which made the flutter valves that made it possible to get to the edge of space with the X1 and the X2 and stuff like that. And when I was 16, I went to work at the world's largest cancer research facility, which is doing pioneering work in immunology. So you would think I know lots of stuff about immunology, right? No, I didn't learn a thing about immunology during that summer because I was running a little a discussion session at lunchtime with people much older than I was, and I came up with a theory of the beginning, middle, and end of the universe that, that summer. But the most important thing that happened to me was, uh, by the way, that predicted dark energy 39 years in advance. But the most important thing that happened to me was they gave me a scientist to watch over me, to mentor me. I think probably to keep me from breaking too many test tubes or, or uh, photospectrometers, uh, very expensive machines. 
And he took me to his office. And his office had this desk about six feet to nine feet wide. And it was covered with very neat piles of books. And all the books were in German. And there was a bunch of books over to our left and a bunch of books over to our right. And Phil Fish, the scientist, said, I'm synthesizing the following chemical. And then he gave me the name of a chemical with 15 syllables in it. And he said, see all the books on the right? Those are the books I've read. See all the books on the left? Those are the books I'm going to have to read before I can finish synthesizing this molecule. And he'd been doing this for five years already. So synthesizing it was going to take him 10 years. And I suddenly realized, oh my god, this is not science as I understand it. He's talking about becoming a mole who digs a hole so deep that all he can see is the dirt on either side, if he can see anything at all, because it's dark down there. Um, and my job is to be an eagle flying over the landscape and seeing how all these little gopher holes are pixels in a bigger picture. My job is to see the landscape. And I even thought maybe I should go get out of science and go into philosophy if this is what science is. The message of science is, as a scientist, look at the things right under your nose. Look at the things going on in this room with this community today, planted in the middle of what's been happening with Park Slope, planted in the middle of what's been happening to the world, and see the bigger picture to the best of your limited abilities. Because if you allow yourself to become that gopher, you will, you will block out everything going on right under your nose. And there's wonder, awe, questions, and answers in what's right under your nose. Wow. Well, um, I guess that leads us to what would you have uh, from, from um, how I accidentally discovered the 60s um, for, the, for the rest of us? For, uh, it's the same message, because we are all perceiving beings. And we all, our, our joys or our lack of joys, come from what we see or what we don't see. And if you really open your eyes to what's going on around you, there is so much to see that is so rich in positives. I mean, there's this little litany, and it comes from the work that I did in another book called The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism. And I, I, you know how books are. You often don't really work out what the book is all about until a year after you've actually turned in the book and it's been published. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so it took me a long time to get to the litany I was trying to achieve with that book. And the litany is this. Every social system that appeals to our idealism, every worldview that appears to our idealism, says it's going to uplift the poor and the oppressed. The system that has done that best is the Western system. Now, I used to have friends coming into my bedroom when I was still stuck in bed saying, and this is especially after 9-11, saying that the Western system is the most awful system in the history of humanity. It's responsible for more bloodshed than any other system in the history of humanity. No, that's not true. And here are some of the facts. If you'd been born in the Western system in 1850, your odds versus being born in 2000 in that span of time you went from a 38.5 year expected lifespan to a 78.5 year expected lifespan. We've doubled the human lifespan. Um, we've increased the average height by four to seven inches depending on what country you live in. We've increased the average IQ by 35 points. If you took a Stanford Binet test from 1916, the first year it was administered, and gave it to kids today, the kids who were being shallowed and dumbed down allegedly by Facebook and Twitter, they would register as marginal geniuses, 135 on their IQ. We've increased the average IQ by 35 points. Most important, oh, we've increased the average income. The, the poorest paid worker in London in 2000 earned what an entire tenement full of the poorest paid workers earned in 1850, seven workers. She earned the salary of seven workers. Not to mention the fact that there was a guy back in 1851 um, who was incredibly powerful, and he was a total techno freak. He just loved new technologies. So he designed a building. It was made all of glass, and he had technology shipped in from all over the world. That's how powerful this guy was. His wife was Queen Victoria. He was Prince Albert. Prince Albert came down with a stomach problem. It killed him at the age of 41. Your average homeless person can get a similar stomach problem today go into the emergency room and will live another 30 years because we have antibiotics. In other words, it isn't enough 
that the average or the poorest paid worker today earns what seven of the poorest paid workers earned in 1850, what she can buy with those things are things that would have goggled the mind of Prince Albert, not to mention kept him alive for another 30 to 40 years. Most important, the, the level of peace in the world since 1650 has gone up by a factor of 10. In other words, if you'd been born in one of those lovely indigenous cultures that lives in harmony with nature and at peace with its fellow human beings, or in the Western world in 1650, your odds of buying a do dying a violent death at the hands of one of your fellow human beings was 10 times what it is today. So there are two points to this litany in answer to your question. Um, one is that if our great-grandparents could give an extra 40 years to our lives, could double our lives, we owe our great-grandkids another doubling of their lifespan. We owe them 160 years of life. If our great-grandparents could give us an extra 35 points of IQ, we owe at least an extra 35 points to our great-grandkids. If the, if the minimum wage today is seven times what it was in 1850, then we owe a minimum wage of at least $70 to our great-grandkids. And if peace is increased by a factor of 10, we owe at least another factor of 10 improvement in peace to our great great grandkids. Those are our obligations. What does this have to do with your question? These are things right under our nose. And we don't see them. If we don't see the wonders we are creating, we will be the killers of those wonders. And none of us can afford to kill a joy, a blessing, or a wonder. We're here to expand joys, blessings, and wonders, and stopping bad things from happening. Well, thank you, Howard. Now, it's a, it's a beautiful memoir of a remarkable life. <laughs> Thanks. Could you, could you read us one of your adventures? Yeah, I'm going to read you uh, one of the chapters. Sure. Thank you, Steve. You make me feel very good. Um, so, OK, here's a story. It feels a little funny to drag these stories from the depths of memory now that us baby boomers are all supposed to be picking out the patterns for our tombstones, counting our wrinkles, and trying to replicate the secret of Ronald Reagan's perpetually dark hair. But speaking as a voice from the crypt, let me see if I can impart some mangled sem semblance of wisdom to this seriously brain-damaged world. To follow this tale of moral profundity, you'll have to travel with me back to the dim and distant days of a long forgotten era. Before Roomba robots, apps that identify bird calls, gaming consoles you can communicate with by twerking, garden hoses that miraculously avoid tying their own creative variations of Boy Scout knots, and drones with which you can watch your wife doing things with some other guy that she's always refused to do with you. Yes, we are fumbling through the swirling mists of the past to those years of astonishing antiquity when even Donald Trump, David Letterman, and Jay Leno were still in their teens, and when Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift, and Miley Cyrus had not yet been born, the early 60s. More specifically, it was 1962. I had just left college without finishing my freshman year, a high crime. Escape from an institution of higher learning before your sentence expired was so unheard of for a middle-class Jewish kid that there wasn't even a name for the crime, just a mushroom cloud of incoherent curses that erupted when your parents discovered your abominable act. The word dropout wouldn't go mainstream in the American vocabulary for years to come. I'd camped out in the basement of a Seattle anthropologist with a remarkably hospitable nature. So hospitable, in fact, that the basement's opposite end was occupied by a charming drag queen who could have given Josephine Baker lessons in haute couture. Somehow this master of the pl plumed gown and feather boa had no influence on our host, but apparently I did. In fact, I accidentally became our host's spiritual master. My hunt for Satori, for Zen Buddhist enlightenment, was so intense that it gave the impression that I knew something. In reality, I knew nothing. All I had were questions. But when you are certain that your questions point to truths that are gut deep, you apparently develop a misleading charisma. Our anthropologist host was just about to finish his PhD thesis. The topic? Ornamental penis cones in the South Pacific. He showed us pictures. His South Pacific subjects were nudists. They wore not a stitch of clothing. 
but stitches exist in fabric, and fabric was not what these macho warriors preferred as apparel. Instead, they had wooden cylinders the size of the sausages Italians feed you with onions and peppers, sausages with deep hollows drilled in their centers, and they slipped their penises into these things, then paraded about proudly thrusting their pelvic appurtenances into the viewfinder of any passing anthropologist camera and wearing these penis cones all day long. Why bother? Because the penis cones were a language, a pecking order language, a language of hierarchy, of who was on top and who was not. Penis cones, like $4,000 suits, displayed status. Thus, a lesson was inserted in my brain about the central role of status in the lives of men, a lesson that would eventually shape my theories in my books. But that's in the very distant future. Let's get back to 1962. Despite the fact that he had almost finished his thesis, the anthropological type decided to abandon his mortgage, forget about his teaching job, leave his shot at a PhD, stop paying for his girlfriend's orthodontia, grab that girlfriend, and follow me and two of my friends to California. Our arrangements for departure were all set. We would head for the nearest freight yard and catch a boxcar headed south. Unfortunately, I got a cold, and my followers left me to catch up with them when I could get better. Not a nice thing to do to your spiritual leader. But they were not heartless about it. They found me a room in one of those environmentally conscious University of Seattle off-campus hovels where no student has washed the dishes for six months, and every platter and fork is turning mossy in the ecosystem of the sink. I had a mattress of my own on a nice, organic, hardwood floor. The boards were biodegradable. You could tell they were rotting. And my acolytes had provided for my recovery with a leaking pitcher of orange juice, a pile of sandwiches, and the company of a remarkably sympathetic horde of cockroaches. Four days later, thanks to the healing powers of this nature-rich habitat, I finally got my health back. I went to the local supermarket, gently laid a quart of milk and a loaf of bread in my shopping cart, then stuffed my athletic supporter with provisions, cream cheese, smoked oysters, and a variety of other delicacies. I paid for the milk and the bread, accepted the more expensive items as a donation, and headed back for the moss-covered kitchen, where I cleared a space between the fungi, spread out my 24 slices of bread, and made 12 sandwiches, packed them in the plastic bag provided as a bonus by Wonder Bread, made a gallon of Kool-Aid in a Clorox jug, rolled the food into my sleeping bag, headed for the open road, and stuck out my thumb. Jack Kerouac, one of my idols at the time, would have been proud. My apostles, the ones who had left me on the floor of a Seattle, Seattle cockroach dance hall, had ridden the rails. I had decided to travel by road. Unfortunately, hitchhiking is an unreliable form of transportation. There are no regularly scheduled pickups. You depend on the milk of human kindness. And the cows that produce this stuff are apparently an endangered species. So as usual, when I propped myself up in the gravel, or propped myself in the gravel by a stretch of tarmac, I was stuck. In eight hours, I'd zoomed a full 75 miles. Now I still had 529.6 miles left to go before reaching my destination, the San Francisco Bay. For four hours, I had been sampling gourmet exhaust fumes on a two-lane blacktop that ran through a collection of five buildings called Eugene, Oregon. Every 20 minutes or so, an approaching car lifted my hopes, then dropped them without a parachute as it disappeared over the horizon. I attempted to summon each vehicle's return with wistful looks, but much as Walt Disney had assured me that when you wish upon a star, your dreams come true, Walt and innumerable drivers seemed to be letting me down. Maybe my problem was that it was still daylight, which meant there wasn't a star in sight. As dust turned the countryside gray, and the first pinpricks of light appeared on the black and blue sky, my fate went through a sudden alteration. An old hearse black Hudson rattled in my direction, flapping the random pieces of tin from which it was made in an effort to warn any farm animals grazing on the asphalt of its approach. My spirits, as usual, went up like a weather balloon. The car grew near, slowed down, veered right toward the gravel shoulder. Then the inhabitants apparently looked me over carefully noted that I was barefoot and had a haircut of a kind unknown to Western civilization for roughly 300 years. The Beatles hadn't arrived to make long hair acceptable yet, and even when they would, their mop tops would not emerge from their half scalps like foot-long worms curled in terminal pain. 
The auto's inhabitants saw that I was carrying a thoroughly disreputable sleeping bag packed with food and my one extra piece of clothing, an ultra baggy bargain basement white sweater, a sweater of a brightness designed to distinguish me clearly from the empty air above the roadside gravel as I plaintively stuck up my thumb in the blackness of the night. The folks in the car were unable to spot my major virtue. I showered every morning. The inspection was apparently unsatisfactory. They picked up momentum, spat gravel, and left me in their dust. The sun had sunk, the clouds on the horizon were red, and so were the whites of my eyes. Eugene, Oregon was disappearing into the gloom along with my hopes. The sort of experience that makes a, re a rejected hitchhiker feel as if his emotions have been plunged into liquid nitrogen. Then a miracle occurred. The funereal Hudson appeared on a side road about 250 feet behind me. Disney's star had worked. Maybe because I looked like Jiminy Cricket. The car's inhabitants had debated about me, changed their minds, taken a left, looped around a patch of farmland, and returned. The dusty rear door of the ebony car opened, spilling two dozen empty beer cans into the road. A pale white hand emerged from the dark interior and gestured. I snatched my sleeping bag and ran, hoping to catch up with this sweet chariot before it could swing across the Jordan without me. It was the beginning of one of the strangest nights of my life. To enter the car, I had to find space for myself on a back seat whose legroom was occupied by four cases of beer. Inside, the figures were spectrally silent. A gaunt, tall man clutched the steering wheel, staring straight ahead. In the dusk, his eye sockets looked like huge black holes. The passenger seat held a smaller person with slick, dark hair who never turned his head. And ensconced on my left was the most genial of my hosts, a round-faced fellow who silently bid me make myself comfortable before he, too, riveted his eyes to the view from the front window and imitated an extra from Night of the Living Dead. I asked where they were going, knowing that at best, if I was in luck, I'd be carried 50 or 60 miles before I was let out to unfurl my white sweater once again. A voice welled up somewhere in the car. I couldn't tell quite from whom, with the most welcome, though ghostly, syllables I'd heard in days. San Francisco. These saviors were destined to take me my full 529.6 miles. Now, one of the joys of hitchhiking is conversation. It's a delight to yank life stories from the unsuspecting benefactors who haul you around. My luck in the sport had always been superb. I had pulled inner secrets out of a carnival barker, a narcotics agent, a Bible college graduate who was fleeing from a conspiracy between flying saucer people and the CIA, and even from an insurance salesman who explained with extraordinary warmth why his kids and wife were more important to him than his career. What do you guys do for a living, I asked. This question was the guaranteed key with which your roll opened the top of the conversational sardine can. But not tonight. My three hosts stared straight ahead. The eye sockets of the driver grew more cadaverous. The last of night disappeared from the sky, or the last light disappeared from the sky beyond the windshield. No one said a word. I tried a few more questions. Silence except for those rare occasions on which a, a hollowed out voice would ask the slightly pudgy figure in the gloaming on my left for another can of beer. I resigned myself to looking out the side window at the blackness of the countryside. Then after half an hour, one of my dark angels of transportation asked a brief question. You don't mind a little heater action, do you? It was getting chilly. So I answered that I didn't mind at all, but no one reached for the dashboard switch that would have pumped out some warmth. Then slowly it dawned on me a faint recollection of Sergeant Joe Friday on the 1950s TV show Dragnet. A heater was a gun. I sat in a cold sweat with mental pictures of my limp body tied to a telephone pole in the desert, slightly marred by a bullet hole in the head. After all, who else was there to shoot? The answer emerged 10 minutes later when we were pulled into a lonely country gas station, one of those gray, unpainted, deteriorating, wooden, all-purpose retail shacks that'll sell you everything from a spark plug and, and a Snickers to an extension cord. The pudgy gentleman next to me and the fellow from the passenger seat disembarked and headed for the modest hut's screen door. The tall skeleton at the wheel kept the engine running and his nerves glued to the open road. Through the plate glass window, I could see an elderly man behind a counter. I waited for a bang, spurting blood, 
and the spectacle of the gray-haired fellow falling over backwards with a startled look on his face, knocking a couple of cans of pork and beans off the shelf. Then I expected to see the duo in whose car I was scrunched run from the hovel with greenbacks spilling from their fingers. Nothing of the sort occurred. When the gunman headed back to the car, the old man was still upright. His would-be terminators were less so. In fact, their postures had been infected by a definite slump. The two slipped back into their places in the Hudson and angrily slammed the doors. We took off. Turned out my companions had been attempting a quick change routine. Such was their expertise that they'd gone in prepared to offer a 20 and get change for a 100. They'd ended up with change for a 10. Oregonian country store operators are apparently a shifty lot. The failure was humiliating. So humili humiliating, in fact, that the trio felt compelled to rescue their dignity. Thus, they finally confessed their line of business. The driver and his partner in the front seat were specialists in armed robbery. They were particularly uh, proud of their ability to break into fur vaults in the wee small hours and make off with skins that numerous small animals had donated to provide warmth for status starved females of the human upper crust. Minks and ermines, for example. At the moment, the pair were out on bail pending trial for one of their more spectacular heists. The guy in the back seat was the one who had botched the short change deal and made the whole gang look like suckers in front of a total stranger. Despite his moronic fuck up, they allowed him to announce his claim to fame. He was a con man. Judging from his recent performance, it was a miracle he made a living. It would take more bragging than this to recover the, the pride the group had lost, and they knew it. So the driver removed the coffin lid from his larynx and confessed the details of his hobby, murdering his fellow men. Well, in reality, his victims weren't really men. They were Native Americans, a species he was sure fell on the evolutionary ladder somewhere below toilet algae. But that didn't keep the sport from having its moments of excitement. Like there was the elderly red man our driver had beaten up and shoved over a cliff at a garbage dump. There was the guy he'd chained to a bed in the basement without food or water. And there were a variety of others on whom he'd demonstrated his marksmanship. So he'd missed a few of his shots. But he assured me when he really concentrated, he could actually hit a target. Turns out they'd picked me up because they were heroin addicts and the supply of drugs in their hometown, Vancouver, had dried up. They were hoping to score some dope in San Francisco, and the sight of my outfit, long hair, no shoes, etc., had convinced them I'd be able to provide leads on where to find injectable materials. Unfortunately, the only drug dealers I was aware of sold aspirin. Before their poppy-starved metabolisms could freeze a Thanksgiving bird and turn them into cold turkeys, they were attempting to stave off agony with substitute chemicals, hence their oversized supply of beer. Eventually, the tale of noble deeds, robbery, homicide, and such petered out. They put a final frosting on their image of machismo by trading lengthy epics of all the women who had given them oral sex, comparing fine points of lingual techniques much too technical for me to follow as they attempted to ascertain which woman had the most acrobatic mouth in Western Canada. But finally, they ran out of peculiarly shaped throats and other feminine orifices to compare, and were left with nothing to say. After all, it takes a long time to drive 529.6 miles. The lack of entertainment and the deprived state of their endogenous morphine receptors were beginning to drive them crazy. Finally, in a last ditch effort to entertain themselves, the homicidal threesome started to ask questions about what I did to sustain myself. I told them how I had dropped out of school to seek Satori, the ultimate state of Zen Buddhist enlightenment. This did not exactly thrill them. I offered them some of my cream cheese and smoked oyster sandwiches. When they heard that the oysters had been transported from the A&P in my jockstrap, they mysteriously lost their appetites. What's worse, this revelation of my life of crime, to wit nourishing myself and my friends at the expense of large supermarkets, threw them into a frenzy of moral disturbance. <laughs> they feared for the fate of my soul. When we got to the fact that I hadn't seen my mother in over nine months, they became hysterical. It was obvious they had an emergency on their hands, a human about to self-destruct. Like a team of paramedics, they mobilized to effect my rescue. First, they outlined the error of my ways. I was living without real goals, they said. No human being could do that. Second, you needed a nice, steady relationship to give your life some meaning. 
like the ones they had with the girlfriends they cheated on back home. If they didn't save me fast, they could see I was going to tumble straight into hell, and they were desperate to catch me before I fell. What's more, I had to go home to see my mother. So the visions of being tied to a telephone pole disappeared from my head, and between midnight and dawn, I received caring, fatherly lectures on how to lead a moral life from folks who poked lead into other people's brains for amusement. Damon Runyon was right. There's honor and even generosity among thieves. An hour after sunrise, the moral lectures stopped. Something almost too exciting to contemplate was coming up. We were about to cross the Golden Gate Bridge. This was the first chance in their lives for my traveling companions to see the Disneyland that every con man and murderer dreams about, the ultimate tourist attraction for felons, Alcatraz. As they caught a glimpse of the fabled island in the mist across the water, all three of them squealed like five-year-olds. The strange thing is this. Over the next few years, I'd get a lot of advice from truck drivers, migrant fruit pickers, psychiatrists, psychologists, corporate presidents, and even rock and roll stars. But in the end, I'd make a simple discovery. When it came to the meaning of life, the murderers had been right. You need a woman. So that's it. <laughs> Wonderful. So why don't we uh, take some questions? Yes, we'll take questions if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll come up with our own. Um, ah, Greg. Yeah, when you were in San Francisco, did you have any contact, being a scientist, with members of the fundamental physics group? No, I was a kid, and with no, and, and I went looking for the ultimate mecca for me. They would have helped you. Well, I was looking for the beatniks. Oh, OK. And so I went to, to North Beach, which was written up every single week in Time Magazine as a thriving home for the beatniks, overrun with beatniks, and the streets were empty, and I went to the City Lights bookstore, Lawrence Ferlinghetti's bookstore, where all the beatniks were supposed to be hanging out all the time when they weren't in Greenwich Village, and it was an empty store, and I walked to the counter, and the person behind the counter really wanted to pay no attention to me, no matter how peculiar I looked. And I said, where is everybody? Where are the beatniks? And he didn't even answer. He didn't even look up from whatever he was reading. So I walked out looking extraordinarily distressed. And a person came. One of the things that I discovered was human kindness is amazing. So I walked out, and I looked really distressed. And somebody walked up to me and said, you look troubled. Could I help you with something? And I said, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm looking for the beatniks. <laughs> and and he, he scratched his head, and he rolled his eyes up as far as they could go in his eyelids. And he thought and thought and thought. And finally he said, have you tried Colorado? <laughs> <laughs> so that was what I was looking for in San Francisco. But there was nobody there, which is why we became the movement. Because there was no movement. And kids need somebody who articulates what they are feeling at, that they thought made them solitary, alone, and crazy. This is one of the discoveries I made in the rock and roll world. My icons, my stars, not only did I tell them, you don't just owe your audience your songs, you owe them your life. And I wasn't quite sure what I meant, but I knew it was true. What I realized is that, that I was helping one subculture after another find its identity through the stars who express that identity. And I just happened to be in San Francisco at a time when nobody else was doing what the beatniks had done, expressing all those hidden angsts. So that's why our movement became a movement. It wouldn't get a name for another two or three years, but then it would be called the hippie movement. And Time Life would do the same. Time Magazine would do the same with us. That they had done with the beatniks that brought me in touch with the beatniks every week when I opened Time magazine in Buffalo, New York. Any other questions? Aha! You make it sound like you wrote all the books, um, like The Global Brain, and during that 15-year period um, when you were bedridden, and that they just kind of spilling out piece by piece lately. Well, I wrote the first three books while I was in bed. I mean, I, I was stripped of any, everything that you can imagine identity to be. I was stripped of the ver I didn't know there's something in us called a sense of being human, a sense of humanity. And 
when, and I had always wanted to get out of the PR business because I learned everything I could from being at the center of attention storms with rock stars. And I wanted to start writing my real work, my, my books. And I'd written half a book when I became sick. And then I was deprived of an identity. And I had to reinvent myself. It took three years. And so eventually I learned I was making a mistake in trying to sit up. That was taking the energy that I could have used for my larynx to speak. I had to lay in bed. And I had two computers set up next to the bed, controlled with one keyboard that was bolstered on bolsters so I could see it when I was lying flat in the bed. And I founded two international scientific groups. And I ran, I mean, I, I wrote three books. But the other three books I wrote after then. So I've continued writing even though I'm upright. Hard as that is to believe. <laughs> any any other questions? You have any questions? Oh yes, Larry. That, that, that Howard did lay, lie in bed, and you, oh, as what? I recall, oh, oh, Ted, you, okay. you, you recall uh, Ted, the Ted working. visited and, me. Yeah, Ted is my mentor in neurobiology yeah. and uh, neuroscience. Uh, you had really only about three three working. Uh, hours a day in which you could uh, have the energy to Well, do. I actually had a lot more than that because it's just that I didn't wake up until around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. I sometimes found myself at work from 5 o'clock in the afternoon till 9 o'clock the next morning. It was very disorienting. I, uh, it took a long time for me to invent a ritual. but So I had these long periods of the night. And Ted brought me, first he brought me a friend. This is Van, Van Philpott. Yeah. Um, he bought me a friend who Ted was trying to save me. And Van Philpott had been doing research on cortical releasing factor, CRF. And Van felt that there was a 50% chance that if he gave me an injection of CRF, it could solve my problem overnight. I'd be back on my feet again and back to normal, which was a fucking goddamn blessing, if you'll excuse this language in a bookstore. But <laughs> at, at any rate, um, and then Van was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer can kill you in three weeks or it can kill you in three months, but it's very, very fast. And I had learned a lesson working from Bob Marley. Um, I was hired initially to radically increase the size of Bob's audience so he could do in North America what he did every place else in the world, sell out 120,000 seat stadiums. He couldn't do that here. And I worked on that for a year and then Bob was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I had a sudden realization. Bob was staying at a chateau in Switzerland to get alternative treatment. Nobody was supposed to know where he was because he was paparazzi material. And he would have been mobbed if they'd known where he was. So Bob would get up every morning at the chateau, go down to the, um, the kitchen. His breakfast would be spread out in front of him, but also newspapers from all over the world would be spread out in front of him. And if a single one of those newspapers said Bob Marley was dying of cancer, um, Bob would stop eating breakfast, go back to his bedroom, never turn on the lights, and sit there in a state of depression all day. So I realized my job is to keep Bob Marley alive. We're all under a death sentence. We're all living in a terminal state of terminal illness. It's called life. And it will end for all of us at one time or another. So the big trick is to make sure that when Bob starts his day, he does not perceive himself as dying of cancer. He perceives himself as living and can have the richest possible day he can. That became my job. So when Van Philpott, you did the same thing. I did the same thing because I had learned the lesson from Bob Marley. And I did the same thing for, for Van, except I had an additional tool. Van was a scientist. Science is me. It's my essence, it's my bones, it's my marrow. And one of the scientific groups I had founded, the International Paleopsychology Project, you could be a member of simply online. So I put Van into that group, and for the first time in life, he felt that his, the importance of his ideas on rheology. You gave him, you gave him a, a meaning, which he'd been searching for. Right, so I tried to give him, yes. this his last three months, I wanted those to be the richest fucking three months of his life. So, and Ted, these things would not have happened without Ted, who's been a very important part of my life ever since 1967. 
In those days, it was called physiological psychology. He was a, an undergraduate. I can't imagine it, but you were. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was also, young. Hard to believe. Uh, 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 quite a good dancer. In the uh, well, the dancing is another <laughs> story. when there were strobes around. Yes, true. <laughs> so, Larry, you had a question? I hope I can um, focus it. Um, so you talked and written, wrote really eloquently about, it seems like you're talking less dogmatically about science than science as a culture. And your, your life has been so connected with other cultures, like hippie culture, the culture of popular music. And you said such uplifting things about all right, what we can recognize in this moment in terms of lifespan, standard of living, peace. Now in terms of culture, do you feel, do you have that rosy view too about this moment? Are we in a good cultural moment? We're in a very dangerous cultural moment. Um, it goes back to what Flake, Jeff Flake said yesterday and what Bob Corker said yesterday. The values of our culture, the values that make us who we are, are being trashed every day in front of our very eyes. And a significant portion of the population, 37%, is so, has its hopes so pinned to Donald Trump that they can't see that the very things that they too believe in are being destroyed. And we're in a moment where we, we have feared that the damage done to our culture could be permanent. I don't know about you, but the, the idea of truth and fact checking have so disappeared from the White House that it's as if they never existed. And in that instant, we've come to realize just how important truth and fact checking are and how easily they can disappear and the culture can change. So you know from the story I've just told that from the age of 12 on, I was using all of my sciences to try to understand the forces of history. And yes, cultures can go through a radical perceptual change in an instant. In the same way that we have people coming into my bedroom after 9-11 who said this is the worst civilization in the history of mankind. And they didn't see the things going on right under their own nose. I mean, for example, over a billion people have been lifted out of poverty in the last 20 years by the Western system. A billion people. There are, uh, between China and India alone, there are something like 1.6 billion people in the middle class, which is, that's salvation from poverty. That's heaven. That's paradise compared to poverty. And these friends were extraordinarily intelligent people some of the most gifted people you've ever seen on planet Earth. And yet they, they put perceptual blinders on their own eyes and didn't see what was happening right under their noses, which means they were threatening the continuation of these astonishing material miracles. In the same way that that was a perceptual blindness and come so easily to folks like us. You know, we're both in the intellectual elite. You are. Um, and... Larry writes for the Wall Street Journal, among other publications. So it seems very easy to go into a cultural perceptual change. And, and Jeff Flake and Bob Corker, I'm a Democrat. They're Republicans. We disagree about a lot. God bless them for speaking truth, because we need that. And we're getting very little of it. And the 37% who are fans of Donald Trump and the 52 percent who watch Fox News or whatever percentage it is, they will never hear those speeches. All they're here, they'll hear is, we have a victory here. Two guys who are not into Trump are resigning, and we can fill those seats with real Trumpies. So yes, cultures can lose it. There is a culture in Mexico, uh, and I always get its name wrong, but it's Teotihuacan. And it flourished for 500 years, then it disappeared. It just disappeared. And the archaeologists don't see any signs of war at all. Well, my bet is they went through one of these perception shifts and came to despise everything they'd achieved. And in the process, drove themselves to the countryside, where, of course, they became poor people, um, and where they produced additional poverty. They certainly didn't produce riches, insight, all the things that culture produces anymore. We cannot afford to do that, and we are too, we are like that. I mean, the intellectual elite 
are, are imagining that if we just get rid of this thing we call capitalism, a utopia will spring up. No, utopias are not automatic. Utopias are hard won, and we have produced a new utopia every five years with our technologies um, these days, and we just don't recognize it. But in the same way that we could blow it, the Trumpies, the, the, the what's his name? Uh, Bannon. Bannon, yes, Bannon could produce a massive cultural shift. Well, there's one piece of happy news, and that is there was a tremendous cultural hijacking of the culture in Germany in 1933, and a similar hijacking in Japan in 1933, and 20 years later, their cultures came back to life in their older form. So there's hope, but it really, it depends on every single person in this room keeping this culture alive and seeing its good points, and then stopping its bad points. And the baddest point right now is in the White House. Hi, Howard. Um, you know my daughter. What's she's, that? I said, you know my daughter. Yes. Absolutely. And she was 51. And wow. I was just thinking, when she was a teenager, and something was happening, happening politically, I don't remember what, and we were driving, and I said to her, remember, Kirsten. You know her as Natasha, I think. Remember. This country always swings right. Remember that, and she keeps reminding me that I told her that. Well, you know, there are different forms of right. Once upon a time, we had a president under whom the marginal tax rate for really rich people was something like 83%. Um, he put in a huge infrastructure project, the, the whole national highway system that changed the way we relate to each other in America, changed it dramatically. And he was a Republican. Now, I, would have, I did oppose him in the 1950s. I mean, I was a kid. But the fact is, there are Republicans and Republicans. I mean, this new breed of Republican, the alt-right, is something that we have been seeing for a long time. People like me, I fought against censorship in the 1980s, against Tipper Gore, Al Gore's wife. And Tipper was being used as a pawn by the religious extremists. Um, and I came into contact with the, the militia movements and other really crazy right-wing religious movements. But those movements are entertained by Trump and Bannon. Those movements, for the first time in my, my lifetime, are doing something that we were afraid in 1951 the John Birch Society would do, that the crazies would take over our White House and our government. Well, the crazies are trying right now to take over our government because they have a president who is a know-nothing, most ignorant person on the face of the earth. Um, yeah, we're at risk. There's an election coming up in 2018, and every single one of us should be working on it in some way. Hey, Howard, back to the... Aha! Uh -huh. It's Brian. Back to the, uh, to the 60s. So usually when people talk about the 60s, I obviously grew up in the 80s and 90s, it's always a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But um, you forget a little bit about the cultural impact of the sort of shared vision and excitement about space and the space program. And uh, assuming, as I do, that in 2018 and 2020 we start to turn this thing around, is there a way, do you think, of re-envisioning a future for outer space and getting a sense that, you know, we're all on the same page around the Earth in terms of... There, there is. I mean, remember how excited we were at the end of the 60s when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the moon. We all tried to be near a television set somewhere. I was at a television set at the Electric Circus, the place to which you had brought me at one time. And, um, and they had these things nobody had ever seen before, eight foot, 10 foot high television screens. And Dr. John played, excuse me, and then we watched as the first men set foot on the moon and it changed our sense of our role, our place in the universe. There is room for that again. I've written a 2,000-word, uh, 100-picture manifesto called Garden the Solar System, Green the Galaxy. Um, we are not the only creatures on the world who can do research and development, not by any means. Bacteria do research and development at least as fast as we do, and sometimes faster. Right now, bacteria are living 12 miles beneath our feet, turning raw rock into biomaterial, into the stuff of life. We haven't figured out how to do that. They're way ahead of us. The one thing that we can do as a species that no other species can do is we can take life beyond the gravity well. 
we can take life beyond the atmosphere. Now, once upon a time, there was a poison pill of stone. It was the home of climate cataclysm. And it was a bald, barren, toxic place. And despite that, life got a foothold here. And it started out as less than a teaspoonful of life, and it's been expanding. It's been going imperialistic and colonialistic ever since, and its mission is to kidnap, seduce, and recruit as many dad atoms as possible and bring them into this vibrant, higher project called life. Well, we've done it with one poison pill of stone, and still we're only a slight film on the surface. Remember, bacteria working 14 miles beneath our feet right now. Um, but we're the only ones who can take ecosystems to other bald and threatening balls of stone and do with them what we did here. That's why it's called Garden of the Solar System, Green the Galaxy. Humans need visions that look up. And we can go into why they need to look up because it's a biological thing implanted in us and it's not just us, it's lizards, lobsters, puppy dogs. Um, up means something special for them. It means hierarchical stature, really, for them. One way or the other, we all need a vision that looks up. We're, we don't have one right now. The Chinese have created one. It's their Belt and Road. It's their New Silk Road that connects 30 countries and 3.2 billion human beings. That's taken over ancient ports like the Port of Piraeus, the, the Port of Athens, uh, and is rebuilding them to be able to handle ships of a size and a sophistication that cannot be handled by any port in North America. They have a vision, and it does look up. Um, we have Elon Musk. We have Jeff Bezos who's trying to catch up with Elon Musk. They're our saviors because we need to look up and we need to have a new vision of the next horizon toward which we will proceed. And new horizons change the nature of everything. So what do you think Wait. sparked the yeah. optimism of the 60s that we could borrow from, learn from, use now? I think that when you, when you have a vision, it was John Kennedy had a vision. He needed, he knew he was in a competition with the Russians, the Soviets, um, and he went to his scientists and said, what can we do to outclass the Soviets? They put up a little ball with a tra radio transmitter in it, the very first thing ever to reach orbit. Then they put up a dog. Then they put up a human. And we haven't done any of these things, or we came in late in the game. We're, how can we demonstrate that we're ahead of them? Part of the answer was we could put a human on the moon because that's technologically possible, is what his advisors told him. But the part they didn't tell him is that's a vision looking up. So when he said we will go to the moon in the next eight years, not because it is easy, but because it is hard, um, he lifted the vision of life we carry within us every waking minute of the day for all of us. And that's what I'm trying to do with all of my space activism. Um, with the multi-planetary mission I'm putting together at Caltech, or I'm leading the team at least. Um, and with my role in the National Space Society and with the group that Buzz Aldrin conned me into starting, the Space Development Steering Committee, which I had, I'm trying to effect a vision transplant. Because a simple change of vision, like those words from John Kennedy, literally takes us through every minute and every second of the day in a different way. And we really need that right now. Okay, well, please join me in, are there more questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. So what is, what is, the, what is the interplanetary vision? What is, what are you... It's to not just take us to space, but to take plants, animals, ecosystems to space. It's to put ecosystems I mean, I would love to see it on the moon. Buzz tells me the moon is a place of hell, and no human should ever be consigned to going there. Um, I would like to see it on the moon, despite the moon's problems. We certainly want to see it in terraforming Mars, which means bringing life to Mars, and then seeing what unique things life does in that environment that it's never done before, because it's under conditions it's never been exposed to before. I'd like to see it everywhere, but mostly in Christmas tree ornaments hanging in space, in giant bulbs, space colonies, because there you can put, you can build space colonies big enough to put parks and forests and lakes and trees and, the, and walk your puppy dog. That makes the most sense because Mars is also difficult. Yeah. 
But remember, we do these, choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. However, these Christmas tree ornaments decorating space, um, space colonies made from regolith, made from the raw material that's in the dust and stone of the moon, from which you can make concrete, steel, glass, and microchips. And whatever comes after microchips are obsolete. Um, there's all the material we need. And, it, and it's in asteroids too. One asteroid can have more dollars worth of material than the entire gross domestic product of the United States. $17 trillion worth of raw materials. It's just, when are raw materials valuable? When we bring our imagination to them and start fashioning them into things people are willing to pay money to buy. Why? To lift the quality of life. To lift the quality of life. Except when I use that phrase right now, I don't just mean lift the quality of life for individual human beings. I mean lift the quality of life by giving life entirely new horizons in which to roam. Okay, well let's congratulate Howard Bloom. Great, hand cap questions. Thank you very much. You've been a, you've been a, I know this. you hear this uh, from every person who goes on stage, but you've been a lovely audience, you've been so good. <laughs>